All right, well, we'll get started then. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about measuring sharpness and resolution. I'm going to go through some definitions. What is resolution? Uh, some of the different methods of measuring it, challenges associated with those methods, some solutions we have for measuring resolution, and um, future developments that are in progress right now. We'll do a question and answer at the end as well. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, so uh, let's get into definitions. What is resolution? Uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, uh, at least the definition that's closest to what we think of in the imaging term is the smallest interval measurable by a scientific or optical instrument, uh, the resolving power, uh, the degree of detail visible in a photographic or television image, uh, such as a, a, a high resolution monitor. That's the example they give. Uh, so this is difficult to translate into a single objective measurement, and I will explain why. Uh, first off, uh, sharpness is, uh, is, is a more complete uh, definition of what, how much uh, spatial information is reproduced across all frequencies, uh, where resolution is, is usually uh, associated with that the kind of limit of, of, of the finest detail that you can see in that image. Uh, so uh, sensor resolution, we don't usually use that as the, as the, the, the key definition of resolution because it's, it's necessary uh, for, for a good uh, high resolution image. But just because you have a lot of pixels doesn't mean that they're sensitive that they're free from noise or that they're isolated from the other pixel, pixels or that your lens really can resolve uh, details on those pixels. Uh, so uh, let's talk about what is an imaging system. So uh, we start with the scene. Uh, we, we take that scene uh, and, and image it through a lens uh, and, and try to focus that, that scene on a focal plane array, uh, a, usually a, a sensor image sensor, and then the, the data, raw data comes out of the image sensor, goes through the signal processor, and at that point it goes to your customer, which could be a couple different things. It could be uh, displayed on um, some sort of display and uh, then presented to a human and then uh, interpreted by the human visual system, or it could be that there is uh, some sort of machine vision, uh, a neural network that's, that's taking that image and uh, interpreting it. So this is, this is where uh, the resolution starts to become a little bit foggy because uh, we don't know who our customer is. It could be one, the other, or both of these uh, folks here. So and another problem is uh, in the scene, what, what we're exactly we're trying to resolve? What's the distance to that object? Uh, where does that object appear in the image? What's the angle of that object? Um, you know, what are the spectral properties of that object in the background that it's uh, appearing on? You know, atmospheric properties, those can also um, limit uh, the re resolution of the scene. Um, then there's the definition of what is visible. So uh, we have uh, here, uh, clearly the one on top is definitely visible. Um, the question is, how many different uh, is this visibles can you see here? And there's actually nine of them. And they have lost, increasingly lost contrast as you go down, down the row here. So uh, the 50% contrast loss is, is kind of uh, similar to MTF50, or it's, it's uh, MTF50 is the frequency where you've lost 50% of the contrast. Uh, so uh, these, these other types of, M this, is, this is typically the, M the MTF we use for sharpness, um, or at least one of the defaults. But as far as resolution, it's going to be one of these much um, higher frequency MTFs. Uh, maybe M MTF 10 is fairly commonly used as a standard for visibility, but uh, it's not necessarily universally uh, agreed upon that if you lose 90% of your, your uh, contrast, that you can't resolve that object anymore. And also, you know, I mean, it depends somewhat on. I mean, if it's a it's a human vision, then it, it may be that that the human visual system and the display also have um, uh, some factors in the ability to resolve. So 
I think we can all agree that 99% contrast loss, 99% contrast loss is definitely uh, not visible anymore. And so uh, um, we're going to focus mostly on MTF10 because I think that's the, the uh, fairly standard threshold for visibility. So in terms of uh, what different systems have limits and what their limit is uh, dependent on, the humans are limited by the display, the image size, and the viewing distance or angle to that image that they're viewing. Uh, and they're also limited by the human visual system and its spatial, temporal, and contextual contrast sensitivity. Uh, machines uh, are very different, and they are limited by the algorithm that you've designed, the computation power, and the energy consumption that you um, can afford. So the main uh, sharpness and resolution metric that we use is known as spatial frequency response, SFR, which we kind of use interchangeably with MTF or the modulation transfer function. This is the contrast of a sign pattern at a spatial frequency relative to the contrast uh, at low spatial frequencies. So we have a definition of contrast here. And then we also have an example of a sign pattern uh, which has not been degraded. And you can see the low frequency sign pattern is uh, resolving um, just as well as this high frequency one. And then Below here, we have uh, a degraded sign pattern where at higher frequencies, it's actually, you can see the contrast dropping off. And so if we take the MTF of this sign pattern, we can see that low frequencies are all good. And then at higher frequencies, we start, we start to drop, our, our response drops monotonically as we go to higher frequencies. So uh, it does usually drop as we, the frequency increases. It does not always, uh, especially in, in signal process systems and we'll get into discussing that here. Uh, so this is just an example of a MTF plot. Uh, this is something obtained from a slanted edge. And the uh, spatial domain is uh, shown on top where we have the function of the average edge going from light to dark. And uh, then we go through the spatial, um, the slanted edge, calculation to uh, you know, take the derivative of that edge, uh, perform a Fourier transform, and then that gets us to the frequency domain where, uh, and then we also normalize to one, that low frequency response. And then we have our uh, spatial frequency response, uh, MTF as a function of frequency. And so you can see going uh, from this low frequency up to the Nyquist frequency, 0.5 cycles per pixel, this is usually uh, the area that, that we care about um, the performance of the most. Uh, so this is a um, example of kind of okay MTF. And, and we have another example of MTF that's, that's not, not quite as good. So you can see that uh, our MTF 50, uh, it falls, it got, drops from um, about a quarter of a cycle per pixel down to, about 0.15 cycles per pixel here. So that's that's the MTF 50. That's the frequency where we've lost half of our contrast. Uh, but I think we're more, more interested in this discussion about resolution or where uh, we've lost 90% of our contrast or most of our contrast. So uh, in, in this sharp case, uh, it's actually beyond the Nyquist frequency uh, at 0.67 cycles per pixel. That's our MTF 10. Uh, in, this not so sharp case, the, the resolution is about half. It's about three, five um, cycles per pixel. So somewhere around here. So you can see that that big change in resolution power. Um, and actually this is all from the same, uh, same image from the same camera. And it's just a different part of the image. So uh, this is close to the center and this is close to the corner. So that, that kind of shows that, you know, don't just measure resolution in one place and think that you're done. Uh, you may have a, a much different resolution somewhere else on the image. Talk about some methods for measuring resolution now. This is kind of a timeline of uh, historical test targets. Actually, uh, and this is going back 70 years. 
or yeah, 70, 71 years. So um, the US Air Force 1951 target is uh, still very commonly used actually, especially with optical designers. Uh, so this is a target which we don't support in Imitest. We probably never will just because of uh, the limited frequencies and the kind of subject subjective nature of you know, looking at these, these tri bars and saying, where, where does, do these stop resolving? So it's very, very uh, um, a target which I wish people would stop using. Uh, there are uh, much more modern standards out there uh, which introduced uh, these um, linear wedges in the EIA 1956. And, um, and then those turned into these hyperbolic wedges and the ISO 12233-2000 target which is still a very popular resolution target. I will explain some reasons why you should not use it. Um, the more modern targets here are the ISO 12233-2014 targets, uh, which introduced uh, a, uh, a dedicated wedge measurement target, high contrast wedge measurement target, sinusoidal Siemens star, and then the slanted edge, um, a lower contrast slanted edge target. And we'll talk about some of the evolution of this standard, which is happening uh, this year in the 2222 edition of ISO 12233. These are a, a collection of targets that are supported uh, for sharpness and resolution measurements in Imitest software. And we'll go over uh, most of these and um, describe um, some strengths and weaknesses. A lot of them are slanted edge, at least the ones on the top are primarily slanted edge SFR targets. And you know, they may add wedges to them, uh, or um, you, know, they, you may see slanted edges uh, appear on these other targets as well. Um, these other targets down below are the, the cyclical targets. So this is a, a sign modulated uh, polar or sign modulated uh, Siemens star. And then this is the log frequency target. And then these are these random, we call them spilled coins targets. They're also known as dead leaves. So uh, first off, I'll talk about the slanted edge uh, SFR and resolution. And this is uh, introduced in ISO 12233 in 2000, 22 years ago. Uh, it is uh, a method uh, that is, it works best. You get the most accurate results when you disable sharpening or you use uh, raw images to test. Uh, I mean, especially for resolution, the sharpening will make the resolution uh, appear much, much higher from these slanted edges. But I think that is, a, um, that is an anomaly of signal processing. That doesn't actually mean that your system will resolve uh, those, those higher spatial frequencies well. It's more of an aliasing, um, translating lower spatial frequencies to appear as if they're sharper, higher spatial frequencies. So I guess um, the real advantage of this is the precision that we can measure um, so many different uh, points across the lens. It's also a fast calculation. Uh, the disadvantage, uh, there's only one angle of MTF per edge, and it is very impacted by sharpening. And we'll get into some other um, little quirks with this too, but this is our kind of main method. The, the wedge resolution is um, also part of um, uh, ISO 12233-2000, and also in the, the subsequent versions of ISO 12233 and this is something that can be used for a TV lines measurement, uh, which is uh, similar to line widths per picture height. That's the MTF units that um, are uh, related to TV lines. So there's a, if you look at MTF 10 in the units of line widths per picture height, that is roughly equivalent to TV lines. Uh, so the advantage of this target is, is it's less impacted by spatial um, signal processing than the slanted edge. So if you have a um, high frequency wedge pattern and uh, it gets blurred out by your um, lens, which is maybe not in focus or not, not a high quality lens, uh, the signal processing, uh, at least current signal processing, can't just go and reconstruct that, that wedge and um, restore it. Whereas the slanted edge, you get this big boost in MTF. It's, it's less in the wedge. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, there's only one angle. Uh, it's this, 
this big long target, which means that there's low spatial precision. You know, you're measuring a different um, point on, on your image on, on low frequencies than you are on the high frequencies. Uh, often this target gets used for subjective analysis. And uh, we don't recommend that because that's, that's something that can introduce error. Uh, there's also a poor precision for very sharp systems uh, at fractions of Nyquist frequency. And we'll get into some details about what that actually means uh, practically. Uh, next method is the sinusoidal Siemens star, um, sometimes known as SSFR. Um, this came with the ISO uh, 2014 revision of the ISO standard. Uh, the big advantage for this is that it has uh, all angles of MPF, uh, not just vertical or horizontal. Uh, it it gets a 360 degree uh, MTF, so you can see not you can see sagittal and tangential MTF um, no matter where this target appears in your image. So the uh, it's also much less impacted than signal processing than the slanted edge is. Uh, the disadvantage is this target is very large. Uh, and so uh, again, the same problems with the wedge, you're, you're measuring different um, parts of your lens at different frequencies, and that means low spatial detail. And uh, it's a lot of, lot of pixels per target, and uh, that can impact the calculation speed. So the random pattern, uh, is um, the target known as uh, spilled coins or dead leaves. Um, this is uh, part of a um, incorporated, at least the color version of this is incorporated in the ISO uh, technical specification 19567-2. Um, it's also part of the CPIQ, the IEEE CPIQ standard for image quality. Uh, the advantage of this target is it, it measures how well your system pre preserves fine detail. and uh, especially for things like foliage or skin, uh, the signal processing has a way of reducing uh, and removing the texture from, from those kind of um, areas that get confused with noise. And so the other, other disadvantage of this is that in low light, there can be some accuracy issues, uh, whether that resolves, um, that, that involves um, confusing noise as texture, or uh, in the case of the um, ISO standard version of the calculation, misregistering the position of the reference target uh, compared to the actual target that you're measuring. Um, and that, that's much easier to do in low light or, or blurred conditions. So this is more of a test of signal processing. I probably wouldn't use this for uh, a, a peer resolution measurement if you're um, uh, wanting that. The uh, log frequency contrast, uh, again, this is a, a something that is mostly useful for seeing the effects of signal processing. Um, this is a sinusoidal pattern that has many different contrasts and frequencies. And it is, um, you can see what, what the signal processing does to these different frequencies. So uh, this, and, and contrast. So usually the, um, the non-linear non processing that's done in most image signal processors, ISPs, um, is, is highly dependent on contrast. So you may see that um, the higher contrast portions of this target um, have their, um, are boosted uh, by this processing, uh, the sharpening. And then the lower contrast portions of this, and especially the higher frequencies, may um, have um, uh, a reduction in contrast uh, as those frequencies uh, get mistaken uh, for noise in the ISP. Um, it also is also um, only one angle. So, you know, this isn't good for measuring kind of lens uh, properties, sagittal tangential um, directions. Uh, and uh, because of its size, uh, it does have low spatial precision and also the speed uh, concerns. So very, very good for um, seeing the effects of signal processing though. Uh, so we'll go over some challenges. So, the goal of any measurement system should be to achieve both precision and accuracy. Uh, so this is a example of, um, we could have something that's precise, but not accurate. We could have something accurate, but not precise. Um, or maybe we'd have problems with both. And this is what we're going for, where we have a repeatable measurement that is 
um, the right the right answer <laughs> or close to it. So there's uh, the main factor on the precision is the uh, the signal to noise ratio in the image. Uh, you want more signal and less noise. And also, uh, depending on the algorithm you're using to uh, analyze uh, sharpness and resolution, um, different algorithms have different performance uh, with regards to precision. Uh, for accuracy, there's, there's some things that will cause systematic uh, problems with accuracy. And those may go in either direction. They may cause improvements or, you know, um, they may be misinterpreted as improvements if, if the um, resolution is increased by that problem, or they may, um, they may cause um, also a decrease in, in uh, the metric you're, you're measuring. So uh, there's uh, many different things that, that can impact accuracy, such as saturation, signal processing, non-uniformity, and chart quality. And we'll go over most of these here. So saturation, this is uh, a big thing that degrades accuracy. And uh, this causes uh, the results to actually increase. Uh, the, the metrics, the resolution metrics, you might get a much higher resolution and sharpness than you actually deserve if, um, if you have saturation in your sensor. So you can see saturation here in this function of the average edge where uh, it's basically clipped the signal here and uh, for all you know, there may be blur um, that's concealed in this uh, kind of saturated uh, zone. Uh, but because of the way it's exposed, or perhaps because of the high contrast of the target, uh, you're not seeing the, the full um, response here. So it's, uh, this is something that uh, uh, is especially a problem with um, high contrast targets uh, imaged by a low dynamic range system. Or if you have an impro improper exposure, um, you'll get this wrongful increase in, in sharpness and resolution. So this is something where uh, it's actually a method that uh, some manufacturers, I won't name any names here, have used to kind of cheat the system and try to pass uh, their, uh, their cameras off that aren't so good um, because they can, um, you know, either use this high contrast target or um, overexpose intentionally, and um, they get this better score. And they're like, okay, yeah, we pass more devices. Well, that is not a good way uh, to get good production yield. And um, yeah, I've, I've, I get a little worked up over that when, when I see that happening, especially for devices where, um, you know, they're safety related things, medical and automotive things, uh, you know. Don't, don't try to use our tools to cheat. And I mean, this is a big reason why we'll never support this 2000, or we'll never fully support this 2000 ISO 12233 target because, uh, I mean, we could write an algorithm to do automatic detection on that, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's gonna give bad results. And so we're, we're gonna try to encourage people to use more modern standards that, are, uh, that have accurate results. So um, yeah, the, there is a clipping warning you'll see when, when this happens. There's also some saturation uh, detection that we have in our software that can kind of um, warn you about this um, along with reporting back the results. Uh, but yeah, the main indicator is this kind of cusp in this function of the average edge. And you can see if you ever have that sharp cusp, that's, that's a good sign that um, there's saturation and um, you should uh, be aware of that. So. Uh, as far as signal processing, if you care only about your lens and sensor, then ideally you want to try to bypass that signal processing and use a raw or a minimally processed image. Uh, if you're unable to obtain the raw image, then you need to be aware of the impacts of signal processing and maybe use some of those methods that are less affected by the signal processing. Uh, so if you care more about your full system performance, then go ahead, use the processed image, you know, use slanted edge MTF, and um, that's gonna give you a good description of actually what is perceived in the image as, you know, how sharp does this image look? Uh, so uh, let's talk about some issues with wedge MTF measurement. So uh, for, for very sharp lenses, uh, if the bars um, of this, this wedge target are in phase with your pixel array, uh, then you're gonna get 
uh, fantastic response uh, from them. Now, if they move to be um, out of phase with the pixel array, uh, then, then those uh, bars, which did resolve very well before, will disappear. So this is something that is problematic, uh, particularly at uh, Nyquist frequencies and fractions of Nyquist frequency. So uh, this is an example of an um, image we, we got from a customer, actually very, very sharp system that is resolving um, pretty good contrast. It, it's got like, you know, 40% contrast at the Nyquist, Nyquist frequency. So this is a, you know, very high quality lens, or maybe it's over spec for the sensor that it's on. Um, anyways, you see, you see this big kind of, um, this sort of oscillation in the MPF. Well, that's always a sign that something is going weird and you should be aware of that. And so you see at Nyquist frequency, uh, there you have this great response and you can see close to this red line is where the onset of aliasing is, or we, we lose count of um, our ability to count all the bars. And then it goes, um, and then it has this very quick drop off. And so what happens there is it, um, because of the distortion, um, these bars are going from out of phase um, or in phase with the pixels uh, to out of phase of the pixels. And they, you can see here, they completely disappear and our uh, contrast goes to close to zero. So uh, if you were to take this chart and move it up a half a pixel, uh, this response would drop a bunch and, and you would get a, a very different or significantly different resolution measurement here. So um, this onset of aliasing is something that we get. Um, it's also known as the limiting resolution. This is something that comes just from the uh, the wedge uh, MTF calculation, uh, so it's it's kind of an alternative to using the MTF ten. And so one of the things uh, that you can do is you can take the minimum of um, like we don't really consider uh, frequencies past Nyquist as being very well resolved because they're actually you know those could be lower frequencies. So um, one thing you can do is you can take the the minimum of MTF ten the onset of aliasing and the Nyquist frequency. And that is a, um, a reasonable metric to use for um, wedge MTF resolution. In this case, it's um, you know, about 1,050 line widths per picture height in this HD camera. So uh, this is, uh, there's a, a post here that, that describes some of this, uh, these issues here. And so, I'll move on to the, uh, actually, let me look at the chat and just make sure I haven't missed any good comments here. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Lou says, you can also get spurious resolution where instead of eight bars, you see seven sharp ones. And actually, I think that's kind of what's going on uh, in this one here. Well, it's not eight bars, but um, it actually aliased right before Nyquist. And I think um, this red line is actually the count of bars and so um, we've lost some of these bars. Um, it's actually nine bars here. Uh, and so uh, that uh, is, I think we lost it because of days, but it's, you know, I mean, if you take a raw image from this system, you'll see it has a very excellent performance, even, even beyond Nyquist frequency. Um, thanks for the comment. Uh, so this is uh, another thing you'll see in wedge measurement. Sometimes in, in systems where uh, you have uh, a lot of noise or um, you know contrast boosting, or I think this is a com combination of noise and, and saturation and, and high contrast here. Sometimes the uh, you may see this kind of plateau um, as you get to these higher frequencies. And, and this is another... Um, problem in MTF curves. If you see they flatten out like this, then, then something is, is wrong. Like they should be monotonically decreasing ideally. So uh, I think uh, this, is, this is something to keep an eye out. In this case, um, the, the, the plateau here is actually right below the 10% mark. So um, it could be that a small change in the properties of this system cause that plateau to increase a little bit, in which case you'd have this giant jump in, in MTF-10. And that's something to be aware of that MTF-10 is not always the most stable of, of measurements, especially in, in, in conditions where you have these sort of plateaus in your MTF. Uh, so uh, 
I had talked some about micro positioning changes. This is just kind of an example of what it looks like. Um, this is uh, 10 different frames um, that are where the, the, the wedge is offset by a 10th of a pixel between frames. And you can see that our MTF is jumping around some because of that kind of um, problem with the res resolving there. And so these, um, the, the stability of, um, there, there's, there's stability issues across uh, the frequencies here. But as you see, as you go up to higher frequencies, things become increasingly unstable uh, from wedge uh, measurements. Uh, so that's enough about wedges. I'm going to talk about some issues with the slanted edges. And the uh, slanted edge non-uniformity is, uh, is a big problem. So if you have a, uh, I mean, ideally, you take a, a, you measure MTF from a system that has gone through the, um, the lens shading con correction or the flat fielding of the ISP. So that's, that's, that's a really good thing to do in, in, in your signal processing, unlike the sharpening, which can um, cause uh, accuracy problems. So this uh, flat fielding will increase accuracy. And uh, non-uniformity introduces this, this error um, where, and it, it, it depends whether the, the non-uniformity is, um, so you've got your edge here, depending on with, whether the non-uniformity um, goes, um, uh, goes with the edge or against the edge, you, you may see that you get either get a boost or a decrease in your uh, uh, edge SFR measurements. And, and so this is a, an example of a sort of uniform um, control image here, and then a non-uniform uh, image where, or a collection of non-uniform images where that non-uniformity is, is kind of rotating around 180 degrees. And so you can see that the MTF uh, drops a lot, and it's, it's all based on this low frequency reference. So what's happening is that we're, we're referencing it to the low frequency, but the non-uniformity is impacting that low frequency. And so you can see that it actually looks almost like, while well, the MTF is going uh, above one, it almost kind of masquerades as, as a form of sharpening. And so, I mean, if you, if you have a raw image and you're seeing MTF going over one, that's a big sign that non-uniformity non is impacting um, your results. Another thing, you, another thing you can do is you can, you can take a slanted edge and you can, you can flip it so that instead of going from light to dark and dark, it goes to, from dark to light. And if you get a different result, that's another sign that non-uniformity is affecting your uh, measurement. Uh, so we, uh, we realized this um, roughly seven years ago, uh, six years ago, and um, introduced a correction in Imitest 4.5. And well, the correction works by kind of um, doing a fit to the, um, the slope of the, uh, of the, function of that the edge away from the transition. And then it, it, it kind of flattens that out. So the corrected version here, you can see most of that um, error in the non-corrected version is gone. So it's not perfect. It's better to flat field uh, or even flat field and do this. Um, so this, this correction is going to be part of the upcoming ISO 12233 2022 standard, which is um, being uh, in the process of being uh, going through final um, revisions right now. Uh, so, I mean, I think measurement repeatability, uh, it is uh, something that affects all types of measurements. It's something you should be aware of and, uh, you know, take your measurement, repeat it several times and see if you're getting back the same results. So, and depending on the metric that you use, you may see that you have much less repeatability. So generally these higher frequency things like MTF10 do jump around a lot more, especially in the presence of noise. So uh, th there's ways of mitigating this. You can maximize your samples by um, making having adequate sized uh, regions of interest. Uh, you can take multiple exposures and, and signal averaging them to kind of average out the noise. Uh, assuming it's uh, shot noise, not fixed pattern noise, uh, you won't average that out. Uh, you can ensure that you get adequate signal level by, uh, you know, that you have enough contrast on your target and um, you have a, a proper exposure. Uh, so uh, actually you want to you 
the more the more photons you have, the less shot noise you're going to have. So um, having a bright a brighter light box is going to mean that you can um, not have to boost the sensitivity of your system to get more contrast, and um, that sensitivity boost could boost noise as well. So um, yeah, you want to get a, a fairly bright light box and get it properly exposed without being saturated to get a accurate and precise measurement. Um, one, another thing you can do is, is you can use um, lower frequency metrics, which are more stable than these higher frequency ones. Now they may not exactly be resolution, they may be more sharpness, uh, but they also, they, they, that stability may uh, improve things, especially if you're doing manufacturing. So the, um, you, you can see here MTF10 is actually off the charts. In this study we did where, where we had simulated noise and we had some sharpening, this MTF10 kind of went to a very, very high level in some of these expo um, exposures. And these other metrics, uh, MTF30, MTF50 were much more stable. Actually, MTF area was by far the most stable metric um, in this study. And that's something that integrates across all frequencies up to Nyquist. And that's a not very commonly used MTF metric, but I think it's an extraordinarily stable one. Uh, and it's fairly, it's kind of similar to the um, Accutance measurement, which is uh, weighted to the contrast sensitivity function of the human visual system. So, uh, but this one is not. So MTF area is a, is a good uh, sharpness metric. Doesn't get used much, surprisingly. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to go through some of the measurement systems uh, that we have. Um, you know, the, the goal of a test setup is to get a target at a working distance, you know, where you're going to actually be using your camera. So this is going to be somewhere, uh, hopefully, be, um, beyond the minimum focus distance of your camera and uh, up to the hyperfocal distance of your camera, which, uh, depending on the focal length, that could be it could be, uh, you know, you know, it could be a meter or it could be 10 meters. And so that hyperfocal distance is the, the distance where it's effectively the same. Your depth of field goes out to uh, effectively the same as infinity. So, you know, like for example, for a, a typical sort of camera phone, we might measure it at 10 centimeters to see, the, you know, autofocus performance up close. We'd use a high precision target to ensure that we had. Um, a, a target that is more precise than the system we're trying to measure. And then we may measure at something like two meters to, to the hyperfocal distance. Uh, so, um, and then the other goal is to, to fill the field of view out to the corners of the image and also have uniform illumination of the target as best you can. Uh, so uh, for close range targets, uh, there's, there's these high precision targets Highest precision target we have is this chrome on glass, which has some, uh, it's costly, it's unitone. Uh, so, and it has to be backlit. So there's some disadvantages to that type of target uh, for sure. Um, there's other um, like film targets that are high precision film we have. It's not as sharp as the chrome on glass, but lets you have color, lets you have um, different tones. Um, it's also backlit and um, the highest precision uh, resolution target that is reflectively lit we have is, is called this um, res checker target, which has a lot of tonal, tonal targets and color targets on it, but also some very high precision reflective targets. So, you know, at close range, you know, one of the problems is if you have specular reflection on your target, and this is especially a problem if you have a built in light source, which is turned on. Well, if you have a specular reflection on your target that you're measuring and you're especially the region you're measuring, that'll destroy the measurement. And so um, the, that, that's, that makes it very hard to measure endoscopes that have built-in light sources. This reflective target is, is one way of doing that. Otherwise you kind of have to disable the built-in light source and use the backlit, backlit target to uh, measure at close range. Uh, at medium range, I, the, we have a, a product called the Imitest Modular Test Stand. And this is a, 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 a target and camera alignment system, also light source alignment. So this is something that uh, works with these rails and we can um, adjust the distance between the, the, the 
camera and the chart up to 3.5 meters. Um, we have a chart holder here and um, we have light light stands where you can get, you can kind of get the lights in a, a certain position, lock them down. And there is um, actually a motorized version of this where you can automate the, the distance changes and also the tilt tilt and uh, pitch and yaw. Uh, so uh, this is a good, good uh, solution for measuring up to 3.5 meters. Now, if you have to go to beyond 3.5 meters, there's a, a longer range test that we have available too. Uh, but let me talk about wide field of view. So that, yeah, the challenge for these very wide field of view cameras is to get a measurement regions in the corners of the image. So uh, up to around 160 degrees, you can use a pre-distorted target and that can help you to get closer to the corners. But as you get to 180 degrees or beyond 180 degrees, these uh, these system, uh, you, you, you can't fill the field of view with a planar target. It's not possible. That'll be infinitely large. So the, uh, we use a, a system that attaches the modular test stand that can kind of have a polar, polar arrangement of these um, slanted edge targets we call um, SFR reg. And these are, can be uh, positioned in the corners um, up to 200 degree field of view. Uh, so, uh, and then this is mount, um, lit reflectively from, from behind instead of, uh, instead of kind of from the sides as is done with the um, kind of normal reflective targets. So um, yeah, you can only use matte targets with this uh, because of the, the problems with uh, um, specular reflection which, which are exacerbated on um, these wide field of view cameras. Uh, so yeah, if you have to test beyond 3.5 meters, uh, well, it gets difficult to fill a field of view, uh, especially if you have a wide field of view uh, at, a, at a significant distance. So uh, uh, relay lenses or collimator lenses can create a virtual image at a longer working distance up to infinity. And so this uh, target projection system uh, involves uh, a test test chart on a light box, a collimator lens, and then mechanical stages that can align the unit under test uh, and also um, line, align it to the optical axis of the collimator and also set the distance between the collimator and the uh, light box, which determines the virtual target distance, uh, which could be up to infinity. Uh, so um, depending on the lens you use with this, um, you can cover between a five degree or up to 120 degree field of view. Uh, if you need to test long range beyond 120 degrees field of view, then things get complicated. You may have to add some additional projectors uh, in the corners or um, use multiple exposures and that, that is challenging. And uh, so next I'll talk about some of the uh, resolution measurements and sharpness measurements that are in development right now. Right. So I mentioned ISO 12233-2022. Uh, actually just submitted a comment for that this morning. And um, we're trying to finish up this standard along with the um, members of the working group, um, the um, ISO TC42 working group 18. Uh, so there is a slanted edge uh, uh, the slanted square was used in the, the older version of this ISO target. At, we're moving to a slanted star target for uh, which will enable sagittal and tangential measurements closer to the corners of the image. And so there's also a uh, fifth order polynomial curve fitting, uh, a um, two key window that's applied to the, um, the edges to improve the stability some. And then, and then the non-uniformity correction, which we added, you know, six years ago, is uh, finally making it into the standard. We actually just missed the revision of the last standard before, um, um, which we would have tried to have that improvement in. And so we're getting it this go around. So, uh, in actually our next release of Imitest, which um, we're we're going to have an alpha release available shortly. Uh, like typically the, the radial plots that MTS have produced have just been vertical and horizontal, uh, but we're, we're changing that to have uh, sagittal and tangential uh, 
plots. So in this case, the, the sagittal regions on this, we're using an SFR plus target here, which has these slanted squares on it. And so uh, there, isn't, um, there isn't really uh, really great uh, tangential and sagittal and tangential MTF in the corners, but um, you can use uh, you know vertical regions on the sides or horizontal regions on the top to get sagittal MTF, um, and you can get um, use uh, vertical regions on the top and bottoms or um, horizontal regions on the sides to get tangential MTF. So this, um, I mean, the, the whole benefit of using using sagittal and tangential MTF is that um, it's going to convey what the minimum and maximum performance of your optical system are, whereas vertical and horizontal um, are more related to the sensor. So the, uh, I think, it's, especially for very wide field of view cameras, we see the sagittal and tangential MTF differ from each other more. And um, also, the lens, lens diagrams that you get are all going to be in sagittal and tangential MTF. So we think this is a big improvement. Uh, I guess the, you know, something to note is that, you know, we want to get closer to the corner than um, we are right now. Like you see the sagittal MTF, um, it's only going to about 70% of the field. Um, the tangential MTF is going only about to 85% um, of the field. So when we move to the slanted star target and we have some, you know, actually modifications of that slanted star that are imitest a specific, uh, we'll get those sagittal and tangential MTFs closer to the corner and um, all four corners, not just the, um, you know, the sides or the top and bottom. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you're interested in joining our pilot program, you can go to imatest.com slash pilot and that release will be out uh, probably later this week. Uh, so that is the, uh, the end of this webinar and I am Happy to take any questions uh, from you. And um, I appreciate, I hope it was a good use of your time. So um, you can follow up um, by contacting our support or sales, or if you want to reach out to me individually, there's my email address. Uh, we also have a weekly office hour that uh, is at different times. This is the time for the, I guess, the US and Europe office hour. We also have a kind of Asia timed office hour that we have on alternating weeks. Uh, so uh, if you would like, you can raise your hand, ask questions. I actually had a, a comment. Actually, I think Fabrizio had submitted quite a few questions in advance, and maybe I can work through those. Um, so uh, yeah, Fabrizio, I don't know if you want to unmute and say this, but uh, Fabrizio said, many times we notice uh, very different values between vertical resolution, horizontal resolution of the image. Uh, what are the parameters of the image signal processing? of the image to obtain the same resolution values, both horizontally and vertically. Okay, so, I mean, I think that there's, there's two potential sources for that. Uh, one would be, I think, lens-related um, differences between sagittal and tangential, tangential MTF, which just happened to be um, aligning up with the vertical and horizontal, um, which you might see in the sides. Uh, so another thing is that, you know, the, the non-uniform processing, the sharpening, it may be treating vertical different than horizontal. So that is, uh, that, that's probably the, I mean, to get the same uh, resolution, I think you would first need to look at the, the lens design and say, okay, uh, you know, is this, you know, are we, uh, did we have a, a lower cost? design that has worse MTF uh, or, or bigger differences between sagittal and tangential. Um, you know, should we try a different lens design? And uh, so if you if you can get sagittal and tangential to align with each other on the lens side, then you can go and um, if, if you can't get that, then you could go on the processing side and you could try to adjust them to try to equalize them in signal processing that was uh, not not treating all directions of uh, uh, information the same. So maybe it would apply more sharpening to the outer portions of the field than it would apply to the center. Maybe it would uh, apply more sharpening to the, the different angles uh, more than the others. 
that's a tricky, tricky question. So I think you probably have quite a few more of those here. So um, I'll, um, if we have time, I'll go look at the rest of your questions. Uh, and Demetrio said, could you please send the link of the recorder, some recording seminar to, to our emails? We will send that uh, after the event here. And uh, let's see, uh, unless anybody else has any other questions, let me make sure nobody's raised their hand. Yeah, you can raise your hand or by, I think at the bottom of the display, there is a, what is it, a reaction thing? You can say, raise hand. Um, so I think I'm just going to find Fabrizio's questions and uh, continue to answer them. Uh, so give me one minute to pick, uh, open these up. Here we go. Uh, so, oh yeah, so there was a, a question of differences between 4K and 1080p. I mean, essentially it's just more pixels. Uh, and then as far as different encoding, there's this uh, different kinds of um, 4K encoding as far as um, there's uh, 444 where the um, luminance and chrominance channels all have the same uh, sort of sampling. And then there's other samplings where um, such as 422 or 420 where there's some sort of um, decimation of the chroma channel. So you have less um, less resolution for chroma and um, then you do for luminance. So, I mean, I think with most of our kind of um, monochrome grayscale sort of um, resolution targets, you're probably not gonna see much difference between these different types of 4K, whether it's uh, 444 or 420. Uh, uh, you, may, you may have to actually have a uh, something that has uh, a transition in chroma instead of in luminance. So that would be something where it's like going from blue to yellow or, or red to green. And, and you could use that to, to see how those different color channels uh, perform um, in terms of their sharpness. Uh, so yeah, I didn't really get into chromatic aberration or axial, uh, axial or lateral chromatic aberration, but those are all um, factors that can influence the um, the color, and you know, either shift those colors uh, to different positions, change the magnification, or have have it so um, you have much much better performance at some wavelengths of light than you have at other wavelengths of light. Uh, so that is that is something. I mean, if uh, I mean, most of the MTFs we were looking at here, we use the luminance channel, which is a weighted combination of mostly green and some red and some blue. And so that kind of green heavy channel is uh, is meant to kind of correlate with the human visual uh, perception of luminance, which uh, very heavily favors green. And uh, also the um, the silicon sensors uh, sensitivity, which kind of peaks out in in the green region as well. Uh, so um, not sure where I'm going with this, but uh, yeah, just just realize that uh, lum the luminance MTF that we've been looking at is uh, kind of a human oriented uh, um, simplification of this multispectral MTF, where not all colors are going to perform the same. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, so, uh, black and white color and chess blocks. Uh, um, so I'm not sure what you mean by color. Chess blocks, maybe. I mean, I think I think of checkerboards. Uh, the checkerboard pattern is usually what we call it. Uh, it could be chess or checkers, I guess. Uh, so, uh, the. Um, I mean, the great thing about the the checkerboard pattern uh, is that it has a, it is, is it has the most slanted edges of any any pattern. Uh, let me get back to here where it was. Went right past it. So the. Um, yeah, this is the checkerboard pattern. Uh, so it's got tons of slanted edges. It's great for distortion measurement. It's probably more slanted edges than you need, to be honest. But it's it's something that has a it's very resistant to different, um, or it's very tolerant to different framing. So you can go close to it, you can go further away, and you'll still get still get good automatic detection. And 
Um, I would say as far as a target that is not good at different distances of framing, SFR plus target is not great at that because you kind of need the bars to be present in the target. <coughs> Excuse me. ESFR ISO is somewhere in between because you need to have these registration markets in the target um, to, to do the automatic detection. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, I got a question from Max. Is there a different method to submit information for the pilot? Pop-up form doesn't appear to be submitting correctly when I check, click the join button. I am sorry for that. Uh, Max, we will follow up. We'll make sure that you're part of our pilot program. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there with our form. Uh, so, um, but thank you for your interest and we'll, um, we'll be contacting you when the, uh, either the alpha or the beta release are, are ready to try out. Uh, so Fabrizio says, uh, uh, there exists a benchmark for 4K and 1080p resolution measures to understand how far we are from the best possible prof professional broadcast 4K and 1080p image. I mean, I guess that is, that is, a, I think that's, it's a hard thing to say because uh, usually the best possible metric that you get out uh, from Imitest is the result of um, kind of extreme amounts of signal processing and sharpening. So, I mean, this is something where certain industries, uh, the sharpening is, you know, it may produce some some halos and fringing artifacts on the edges, but it, you know, not everybody's trying to take a beautiful picture. Um, there's there's things like security and automotive where you don't care about um, these sort of artifacts. You care about being able to identify somebody in your in your scene. You want to find, you know, not back over your 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 kid and with your car, or you want to see the bad guy in the dark. So um, in these cases, the extreme sharp sharpening is actually a reasonable processing step to perform. And so uh, it's it's hard, I mean, because those that, that processing can make the, the metrics go kind of off the charts, then it's hard to say that, oh yeah, these are really good because they're sharpened to heck. Uh, and, and really um, you wanna have a good performance, uh, like for, for a beautiful pictorial image, you don't want those artifacts. So maybe you don't you don't need the the resolution to be that high. So it's it's something where uh, we really can't say this one system is the best. And and it's because I mean you may uh, I mean there's some things that are done like sensors uh, are they have anti-aliasing filters on them or optical low pass filters which are meant to kind of um, spread the the information between the different pixels. So that it, you don't have this color color moray patterns. I think we saw the color moray happen in uh, this image here. You could see the color moray happening. Um, this is actually a simulated image, so there was no there was no low pass filtering. So you see this really ugly color moray. Uh, so uh, color moray is um, made worse by not having that filter. Uh, it's made better by these really advanced forms of signal processing that take multi-image exposures and handshake and, and kind of mitigate the color uh, moray with that and actually can super resolve some. So uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say that a image is, uh, you know, that there's a, there's no, there's no reference imaging system. There's always going to be some sort of disadvantages to any particular system. And um, that's why we, we kind of, don't get in the game of, of saying, hey, this is what your MTF should be. Uh, we say, okay, yeah, maybe your MTF is really high. Maybe you have very high resolution sensor with tiny pixels, but maybe that has introduced a big problem with noise in your system or texture result resolution. So uh, there's trade-offs across the board with any any form of imaging and um, or all the image quality metrics. And, and, and so the hope where you just have a good you know, what's the best? Uh, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to answer. Uh, so, okay. Um, let's see, uh, which codex, uh, Salvador asks, which codex can 
manage to get information from the file. Sometimes in transcoding, we get wrong information. Um, so I guess I, I'm, I'm wondering, what do you mean by wrong information? Is that, are those artifacts? Are they, um, I guess I'd need more information to answer that question. Um, certainly the, the, the transcoding uh, works much better with kind of this sinusoidally modulated features than it does with uh, edges, sharp edges. So uh, yeah, I, I would say the, the problem of uh, the effects of um, going over a transport uh, stream, those could definitely impact resolution. And uh, it's something where you'd, you'd have to look at uh, many different frames, not just a single frame, but you know you want to look at keyframes. You want to look at in between frames, and and really having a still a still target is uh, is the is the best easiest case to resolve properly. And so, you know, you may want to have. I mean, if you want to challenge a codec, you need to have a lot of things moving in the scene. And I mean, I think that's um, you know a lot of times we we produce these kind of yeah sharp targets and uniformly lit. But in the real world, you know, there's there, and you know, everything's gray in the background. In the real world, the, the systems are uh, going to be, or the scenes are going to be much more challenging. And um, so that that's where you know there may be things like a, a moving target um, that are um, beneficial to challenging codecs. Um, we have a slider uh, uh, that is part of the MTS uh, system. Let's see if we can find this here. Um, that where you can put a resolution target on a um, on the MTS and um, and then have uh, have this kind of linear stage that moves that target back and forth. Um, so uh, that's uh, for motion blur. Uh, that's that's a uh, something that's valuable uh, for measuring motion blur. And you need a you need a moving target. And you could put, uh, I think for autofocus the uh, the texture. Texture patterns are going to be a part of the next autofocus stat standard, and um, you'll need to have them on some sort of moving stage to um, to test the autofocus. Um, okay, uh, yeah, uh, Salvador, if you have more details on that, I'd be happy to to see them. Um, maybe this is the last. We're at the hour here, so maybe this is the last question here. Um, what happens when you use a monochrome monocolor backlight like red or blue to measure MTF? Uh, would that identify resolution of that wavelength? Uh, uh, short answer: Yes, <laughs> yes, it would. So uh, I think you would um, you would probably. Um, I mean, in in the MTF measurement, in and I guess I can show you uh, quickly here. I'm gonna. This is our new interface for Imatest. Uh, I will select a image here and. Um, do a quick run of the, I'm going to do the ESFR ISO module. Uh, so, so here's an ESFR ISO image, and I'm going to select the ESFR ISO analysis. Actually, one of our features in our next release is that it'll automatically recognize what kind of target you're, um, you just loaded in. Um, so, um, yeah, when you run this analysis, I mean, the default is that it's going to use that luminance channel for MTF. And so there's settings where you can, uh, I mean, in the output file, it will uh, it will output all the different um, colors, at least red, green, blue, and luminance. Uh, and um, what we're, uh, what you want to do, would want to do in the settings is uh, if you have, you can, you can select the channel that you're using here. So let's see, this is a little small here. Let's see if I can zoom in on this. Um, sorry. So yeah, there's a um, a channel here where you can pick um, you can pick the channel you're working with, red, green, or blue. So yeah, you don't want to use luminance if you're if you have a monochrome light source. Um, or alternatively, you could just I, I guess if you have a monochrome light source, I would think that you would probably also have a monochrome sensor, in which case. You wouldn't have to worry about the call, uh, the channel selection because it it wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be uh, applicable to a um, monochrome image. 
I hope that answers the question. Uh, okay, so uh, the uh, I guess we're at the official end of the webinar. Uh, I'm happy to answer any more questions um, after we're uh, um, offline. Uh, I appreciate you for joining, and um, thank you.